Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in for uh, today's discussion. Um, my name is Kyle, I'm gonna be running the show today. Um, we are just getting uh, everybody logged in and set up. So if you wanna sit tight, maybe uh, get a little refresh for your water, uh, we'll be jumping in here shortly. All right, thanks everybody for joining us today's presentation, uh, why your talent transformation is at risk of failing. Uh, we are gonna have a roundtable discussion with a few of my friends from the industry on the realities that um, talent leaders and talent teams face when they're embarking on uh, transformation. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Kyle and um, I'm the director of strategy here at Beamery. Um, I uh, have spent a decade studying the uh, evolution of um, technology in the talent space, studying emerging best practices, and uh, I've got to say I really love it here. Um, I, I think that the, the work that we're all doing has a huge impact on the world around us, um, and it's important. Uh, I'm really, really geeky for talent technology, and so um, the opportunity to wax philosophical with some of my friends for joining today is um, really valuable to me. Um, and that's because I, I don't like to just sit here and pontificate and think about these things. I really have dedicated a lot of my time and energy to helping uh, navigate a path forward for talent leaders. Um, by day, I, uh, I'm, the, I, I'm a researcher and advisor here at Beamery, an evangelist out in the market. Um, and uh, at night, I'm a dog dad. You actually might see my dogs peeking in and out um, during the session today. I love fantasy novels, and um, I also love my role as a house husband, <laughs> cooking, cleaning, you name it, laundry. <laughs> um, so before I introduce my panelists, I actually wanted to let you know a little bit about why we are driving this conversation today. So um, earlier this year, we did an analysis of um, survey responses from um, over 400 talent leaders um, in the US and UK, CEOs, CHROs, VPs, directors, managers of talent. And the questions that we had for them all revolved around what talent transformation meant, what their experiences were, and what kind of challenges they were encountering. Um, we, we looked at a number of different aspects, but what we definitely saw was that this, this transformation stuff's not easy, and we can't take any of it for granted. We had questions about whether they were setting the right priorities, um, whether they were identifying, addressing the right gaps, and uh, which stakeholders meant, uh, mattered most um, in the whole conversation. A couple of key findings, just to give us some context for the conversation today. Um, the first, when we asked these talent leaders about what their priorities were for talent transformation in 2021, uh, well, the, the number one response was improving recruiter efficiency and resource utilization, making sure that um, the teams were utilizing the systems and, and processes that were in place to, to drive results. 
um, which it, it comes as no surprise. Efficiency is always really top of mind for talent leaders. But what was concerning to me was that improving recruiter experience in tra through transformation efforts was actually the lowest priority across all of our demographics. In fact, efficiency was two, almost, uh, almost two and a half times more uh, of a priority for organizations today than the actual experience of recruiters themselves. Um, I think also of note was that uh, a lot of organizations are focused on prioritizing data-driven decision-making. Uh, we all know that um, hiring with gut is um, something that puts an organization at risk for unconscious bias. Um, and it's also just not sustainable when you start to scale it up into a large um, enterprise organization. We, we've got to do better and we need to think about how we implement more data-driven decision-making into, into every aspect of the talent organization. If we look then at what gaps we need to close to get us there, uh, well, from uh, the C-level perspective, the most important gap that's having the greatest impact on talent strategy today is technology. Um, and uh, of course we know this, uh, that's why we see so much investment um, over the last five years in modernizing recruiting systems and um, integrating uh, solutions across the ecosystem. Um, and we've seen widespread disruption just across the world around technology specifically. But what's interesting to me is that from the talent team's perspective in particular, there's actually one gap that is more important or, or more impactful that is, which is operational gaps. So whereas technology is something that is having impact on their ability to evolve and to deliver, I think it's important for us to note that embarking on talent transformation requires us to close the loop on both uh, technology and operations at the same time. If we look more, more closely at what technology gaps need to be closed, however, it, we asked the talent team um, the different aspects of technology gaps that are having the greatest impact, that are, that are um, the most important to them. And it comes as no surprise that new foundations are actually having the great, are, are, are most top of mind. Automation, analytics, artificial intelligence, these are things that are in every buying cycle that I've seen lately. Um, and it's also an area where there's just a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknowns. And so from the VP of talent down to the manager level, um, this is an area that uh, is some cause for concern. And so, um, of course, core systems like ATS and CRM and, and HRMS are also top of mind here. Um, but I, I think that we are really focused on this hottest corner of technology, um, that AI and analytics automation space. Uh, which is why we've actually asked some of our um, most strategic partners to come and join the conversation today and discuss what they're seeing out in the market. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our panelists for today. Um, and I, I just want to check in here. Athena, are you are you able to get your camera working? Um, I know that you're, we're having some technical difficulties. I'm, I'm here. The camera is still up and coming, but I'm grateful to be here. And thanks for having me, Kyle. Yeah, of course. Well, I, I mean, you founder and CEO of Hired Score, um, also a close friend. Um, I love working with you and also um, sharing ideas with you. And I'm really excited to have you here bringing some of your experiences in serving the Fortune 500 um, through um, some of the fully optimized talent acquisition uh, functions. So thanks for joining. And good luck with the camera. <laughs> I'm going to keep buying you as much time as I can. Uh, <laughs> second, we have Josh Seacrest, uh, who's VP of Client Advocacy at Paradox. Uh, hey, Josh, welcome to the conversation today. How are you? Pumped to be here. Thanks for joining, man. Uh, especially being so new to the role at Paradox, um, you just really? recently joined. Uh, and previously, you were the head of global t uh, talent strategy at McDonald's, right? Absolutely. Yep. And uh, got to be head of global TA prior to that and spent a, a nice chunk of time at Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, doing a lot of different leadership roles within HR. Excellent. Well, I hope that you, above all, can hold us honest today. Uh, make sure that we're not getting too pie in the sky with um, our ideas. Uh, keep us grounded in reality since uh, <laughs> you're coming right out of the front lines. Will do. And then uh, Dave, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, he's the Senior Director of uh, Recruiting Products at Workday. And uh, you have been so brave to jump in here um, at uh, at the last hour. Uh, and join the conversation. I'm, I'm really glad to have you. Yeah, excited to be here, Kyle. Thanks for uh, including me in such a such a strong and awesome panel. Absolutely. Um, all right. So what I want to do actually is turn off my um, 
turn off my slideware for a second um, and actually just move over to um, our our video. Um, Athena, you are still here and a strong presence in spirit. Um, I, I I mean, <laughs> genuinely, <here. laughs> Athena. Yeah, I know. And and genuinely, I I I, um, I know you want to get the video working. I think that your ideas are and perspective is even more important. Um, so don't don't get distracted with that. Um, really, we we can keep the conversation going from here. Um, but the first question I have for you all um, is really about like what does this transformation thing even mean? Um, you know, I, I see the the word being thrown around a lot. Um, I see it getting quite a bit of uh, a buzz treatment. And so I thought maybe for our conversation we could just start with um, creating a, a working definition. Uh, and David, maybe I can start with you. What, what does talent transformation mean to you as a solution provider? Um, what does it mean to your customers? And, and more broadly, what does it mean to their stakeholders? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Just even defining what transformation mean, it means, I think, really helps us ground the conversation because it can go in just so many directions. Um, I think for me, transformation means helping build the technology uh, and solutions for our customers that enable them to actually let technology in some ways get out of the way and help them help them build the strategies and, de and deployments and, and models that they need um, to be successful. And I think that for our customers and, and for Workday, our customers are the CHRO, the CIO, in some cases the CFO. One of the things that, that they talk to us about in terms of transformation is not a it's not a one-time thing. It's not a let's mm -hmm. transform and then we're done. There's no like finish line. What they're looking for are, are solutions, and they talk to us about solutions and capabilities that are actually empowering them to continuously transform. And so mm -hmm. through that, what I think they're what they're really looking for and what they talk to us about are solutions that enable them to have greater agility, greater flexibility, and technology that more seamlessly interacts and flows with uh, the rest of what the business needs. And so I think that that agility is really, really top of mind. But I think it's not just the technology either. We hear from customers all the time that, you know, Workday could deliver uh, or Paradox uh, or Hired Square, we could deliver excellent features, but uh, that's just one part of the transformation is the capabilities that our tech delivers. Uh, there's a much bigger picture. And I think you and the audience all know this, um, but, but it's also about aligning those stakeholders, aligning the budgets, aligning the timing, and most importantly, and I think this one's often overlooked, is, is, is aligning on the why behind why that transformation is taking place and making sure that all the folks along, along the way that are working on it are clued in on that. I think recently, I mean, we've been talking about transformation for a decade in the talent acquisition space, or longer than that, but a couple of things happened in 2020 that really pushed us into it, forced it, forced our hand, made us really focus on what does transformation look like uh, in a, in a you know, 2020, 2021 world in, th in terms of things like diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social justice, and the, uh, topics like working from home, and topics like internal mobility. And so 2020 was a really good example of demonstrating to CHROs whether your technology and practices are set up to help you transform, or if they're standing in the way. Yep. Yeah. No, really insightful and uh, setting the bar high to get us started here. Thanks, Dave. Uh, <laughs> I, I really do want to come back to this alignment point of view as well as the continuous transformation. Um, but Athena, maybe you can weigh in on, on, on us here. Let's just park it on this this uh, question first. What does talent transformation mean to you and, and uh, to uh, to your customers at Hired Score? Oh. I see a video camera working. Are you coming in? <laughs> I hope so. Um, well, anyway, <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you just fine. See me? Still not see me? Still can't see, but I'm slacking my team to see what, what's going on. So go for it. All right, great. So so for hired score, I think it means um, the the transformation means a shift of a lot of the goals that the orgs have been sprinting towards historically, right? Cost, quality, speed, delivery, satisfaction on a candidate level, on a TA level. But increasingly, we see the diversity and inclusion transformation. Um, 
incorporated into that agenda. And I think what's really interesting about that is the notion of, um, it's asking me all kinds of prompts, so I'm trying to control the, the spaceship, but also speak, also keep speaking. <laughs> The, um, <laughs> the agile, Athena, come on. <laughs> I think what's fascinating about the transformation we're going under now with clients is some of these metrics are more mature and some of them are very nascent, right? So um, the notion of diversity and inclusion, what gets measured from a TA perspective, a TM perspective, a candidate experience, a recruitment marketing perspective, that's an amorphic, constantly moving, and then we add by country, we add by um, by definition, there's the legal definition of EEO and OFCCP, and then there's disability groups, neurodiversity, and an ever widening um, expansion. So I think the transformation is how do you keep an eye towards delivery and mm -hmm. quality and time and the historical metrics that have mattered to the business while juggling these new metrics and new mandates, um, especially that diversity and inclusion one, and, yeah. and do all that with the same people that historically ran other programs or other metrics or other agendas. Yeah, really interesting, um, especially because I, I think what you're, you're calling out here, Athena, is that transformation oftentimes it takes us to look at new problems, <laughs> new opportunities, um, but the old challenges don't go away. Um, and there's something that we need to make sure. Oh, I see you. Yeah, you look beautiful. <laughs> um, thank you for joining. I'm glad you can make it. Um, but but honestly, I, I think that we're we take the opportunity. Do you hear my dog scratching? She's so funny. We take we we take this transformation conversation. We immediately go to something else um, instead of staying here, where we actually need to be solving problems that exist. So focusing on delivery, I think, is great. Um, Josh. What about you? What's what's transformation mean for you? Practitioner now coming over to the solution provider side, but, but still advocating for clients. Yeah, I just love this topic. It's like what fires me up because it's it's this um, how do you take leaps, not just little steps. So it's not just you know, incremental improvements where I think we've all been probably for the last 15 years. You know, how do you have a slightly better ATS or a slightly better X system? It's you know, Dave, I think what you were kind of talking about, you know, what's sort of our why? What are we trying to solve? Let's like hit up the whiteboard and come up with new cool ways to do this simply. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's like, that's what we've all been pumped for. That's what we've all been ready for the last uh, decade. I think the technology is finally there. And to, to everyone's point, I mean, it's not just tech, it's tech alongside other things. Um, but wow, I mean, even over the last two to three years, the, the power that we've seen to be able to transform organizations, allow our teams to be talent advisors, allow for us to spend a lot more time um, really focusing on the DEI space, a lot of time really getting into our internal teams. Um, I just think it's a really exciting time. And for companies that are already kind of in the tech space, I think they've been able to really benefit from it during COVID times and being really agile and seeing what that could do for them. And then I think for organizations that haven't tapped into to that and are just on like the beginning phase of their transformation roadmap, there's kind of this exciting opportunity to generation skip. I mean, they can they can get in and and do some really cool stuff, um, you know, with, uh, I'd say it's gonna take some work, but um, you can put some pretty elegant solutions out there. Um, and Kyle, when, when there's time, I'm happy to kind of share some examples from, uh, McDonald's land because I think the the team out there did some super super cool innovative stuff. Yeah, you're like fresh off of the transformation train, right? Is <laughs> yourself. Yeah, yeah uh, and I mean, well, like, I... oh, go ahead. No, no, please. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, only a few weeks in here at, at Paradox, and and really kind of it's been cool to be able to see how other organizations and companies. Um, you know, of scale and and um, some that are small organizations are really starting to tackle these issues. But you know, the McDonald's uh, you know piece I think kind of started with this like super cool innovation story of you know uh, in restaurants. You know, when you think about the scale of a McDonald's, we're in 120 countries. You're you know almost two million employees. Um, you know, we have to be competitive and fast to be able to keep the restaurant staff. Um, you've got your 
recruiter is your general manager who's doing just everything. Um, you know, they're life coaches, they're uh, running the business, they're making sure that your, your customers are, um, you know, being well taken care of. And I mean, they were just bogged down on the recruiting side. So, you know, the idea here of, you know, do you just replace an ATS and make it incrementally better um, was like quickly replaced by our leadership team to be able to say, hey, how do we, how do we approach this in a truly transformative way? How do we become one of the fastest for applications and getting back to candidates? How do we treat candidates better than anyone else? Um, you know, how um, do we return time to hiring managers in, in restaurants? And so um, that just kind of reframing some of the questions, being able to whiteboard it, kept us from just going down kind of this path of like what's incremental tech versus what could be transformative tech in, uh, in processes. It probably doesn't surprise you that we partnered with Paradox to be able to put a lot of that together and have just really seen um, that product, uh, I mean, just kind of be a game changer within, within what restaurants can do. I mean, I, one thing that I, I really like there is um, McDonald's is one of those organizations where the candidate experience is a customer experience Right. I mean, we 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 we've thrown that that catchphrase out for a long time. Um, but for I mean, just speaking plainly, a company like Beamery, the people who apply for our jobs are typically not going to actually be our customer. We still want to deliver a high quality candidate experience because that's just good business. But for an organization like McDonald's, that pressure is definitely much stronger, much more uh, um, yeah tangible. Right. Oh, and, and you'll see it in the process. You'll see people actually, you know, at the drive through, you know, clicking the, the text to apply, doing the quick video on their phone to be able to do their interview. I mean, it's, wow. it's to your point, there's such overlap there, but that makes it really fun. It's really engaging. Yeah. You know, if, if I can ask and bring this over to, to Dave and Athena, um, what I see here, talking about the candidate experience, customer experience is an alignment of business priority. Uh, with talent plans, talent strategy. They are v acutely aware of the importance of experience in both levels. Um, and both Dave and Athena, you brought up uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, talking about um, you know things that are driving talent transformation. I see here, again, this intersection of business priority and talent strategy, talent priority. And so how can we align here? So uh, I don't know, uh, let me just see here uh, who's up next. Um, yeah, David, maybe I can come to you for a second and talk about um, the use cases that are driving here and um, and, and maybe if you wanna dig into D&I. Yeah, so I think from, from a use case perspective for transformation, I mean like the list, uh, the long list, right? The things in our world today <clears throat> that are driving us to look at talent transformation digital transformation. We, we talk about DE&I for sure. We talk about skills-based hiring. Internal mobility is a topic that we hear quite a bit at recruiting, at, at Workday, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of uh, trying to bring transformation in, into the process. We talk, obviously, remote hiring is new. Uh, bringing TA leaders closer to strategy. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> You're having a Marco Rubio uh, moment. <laughs> I know, I guess so. Good thing I actually brought some water. Um, but yeah, from a DEI perspective, I mean, man, that's a topic that we've heard. Uh, it comes up in every conversation we have with with strategic leaders at, at, at Workday customers, where the question isn't just like, how do I implement DEI strategies better, but how do I transform my organization from a from a training perspective, from a technology perspective, from an adoption perspective, and you know, we're, we're trying to make sure that we're creating the right sorts of tools and capabilities that help empower those initiatives. But we've also learned that some of those things are, they're tough. They're tougher than you might think they are in order to figure out how to implement them, figure out how to get by and figure out how to do them in, in, in the right way. And so what, what we've been trying to do with, with our customers is, is really partner um, with, with solutions, right? Like in, in trying to deliver not just the capability to, uh, for example, we recently released something we call masked candidate screening, which allows you to mask some of the, the data about a candidate when you're um, going through reviewing and screening a candidate. Um, just having that capabilities, it's really just the, the, the thing that enables the conversation to happen. Now we can go talk to the business leaders, to the hiring managers, to the recruiters about how we turn something like that on, how we use those capabilities and how we help 
uh, how we help drive some of those initiatives. So again, I think it's back to that this technology, but also also driving adoption and and making sure that we have buy-in from the from the right leaders, the right stakeholders um, to help the companies uh, push through some of their own things, that, some of the things that they already care a lot about. Sounds like I was muted. I Sorry, my dog was scratching. Start my video rocket ship. <laughs> well, what I said was pretty genius. Um, so I'm gonna let let it rest. Just kidding. I, I was gonna say, Athena. You know, um, I always give you so many compliments for the, the the level of advisory relationship that you're able to achieve with your customers in particular. Um, and I think a huge part of it is because you are very tuned into what they're trying to accomplish and the obstacles they face. So I'm curious for your, your perspective here, and I'm going to throw a, a secondary question here. What are the use cases you see that are driving transformation, and how has this changed from December 2019, when we thought 2020 was going to be this you know big societal landmark, but in a different way entirely? Yeah. Well, I think two things. So to, to touch on the diversity and inclusion piece, we found very similar to what Dave mentioned. It's one of the... It, it's one of the primary talent projects or processes that the executives, the board, and the shareholders care deeply about. Mm -hmm. So when you have that top pressure into TA in we have to drive these goals, we found the those in many orgs, those goals have, have mattered, but haven't been quantified and pressured at the level that they are today, of course, from Black Lives Matter and, and everything we've been through over the last year. So th the notion, our d &I solutions start with an analytics suite and start with a data workshop and start with almost what you would kind of imagine the most evolved people sciences team could deliver to that TA org about mm. where are the gaps, how are the gaps expressed? Because we found the clients need a roadmap of where to begin and what to start solving because the vastness of this problem and even where you apply that. Um, and I think also myth busting that there's not a silver bullet solution that's gonna now go solve all the, it's got so many heads and elements. We support one piece of that, which is called from supply and demand to final selection to talent mobility but there's the recruitment marketing piece the attraction piece there's the unconscious bias training which is offline there's the you know um kind of groups and advisory and mentorship and all these other elements so we like to speak at it from what's the 3000 feet what's the one part that this set of solutions is going to solve and then now let's go look at the data to say where do we begin and how do we use that to build a roadmap so that yeah. it can be digestible um right. and i think that connects to your other question around the kind of advisory consultancy we see the ecosystems of solutions that matter for ta are growing wider and wider so a mm -hmm. majority of our clients have workday right which is and should always be your system of record and we see a lot of these crazy ideas like we'll build it over here in this separate system a job catalog and inventory no that's workday this is your system of record and your core um but then they need an assessment test and a game and a best in breed chatbot and a scheduling automation like a paradox and an lms system service now and microsoft teams is also even part of this so we're looking at 12 to 20 ecosystems of third parties or other solutions that impact ta and our, our nucleus's ability to bring that together, I think also just reinforces that mindset that it is an ecosystem and you need all those components to speak. And then kind of how can we help everyone think about how does data update back to systems of record? How do all your third parties know what's going on at all points in time? And how do you make the job of executing and delivering that transformation not about the tech or the data flows or the data gaps or what systems do I do what in, just make it all work for those end users, right? Well, I mean, yes, you articulate it very well. 
Um, but Josh, I mean, help me out here. That it's not easy, right? I mean, just the, the sheer scope of the challenge that you face from a systems and ecosystems and legacy processes. Um, it's it's all a rat's nest, right? Uh, that especially for recruiting in particular, but the tip of the spear for a lot of this has such limited opportunity to drive any change. Uh, for you as a, like, if you could draw on your experience as a talent leader, um, how do you overcome? How do you push through? Is, is it Dave's advice of aligning on the why, making sure that you, your senior, your senior leader, their leader all understand what we're trying to get done so you can, you can be empowered to push through? Like, what is it? Yeah, it, hey, there's there's a lot there. I mean, I think to Athena, there's probably not a silver silver bullet to pull that, but I think uh, vision and leadership buy-in is going to be key. So, what's what are you solving for first, and how's that going to actually like help the business and drive it? Um, and then I think we're in a super um, important time for TA leaders. I think we've uh, probably haven't had the attention from the chief people officer and chief human resource officer in our organizations that we have today. Um, mm -hmm. COVID has allowed for them to really uh, focus on communication efforts at all levels. Um, they're highly invested in quality over just time. Um, mm -hmm. I'll get to the time piece too, but, mm -hmm. and then the DEI component, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, super important and it's going to be, if not already, embedded within each organization. And as a result, you've got uh, a lens that maybe you didn't have before uh, being such a huge champion for you to push through some of this transform transformation and, and change. So I think that's a, a, a huge dynamic uh, shift that will be super, super helpful. Um, I think the other piece in terms of like how this is shifted, I just love that question from you know, what's the difference between kind of today and even a year, year and a half ago, is I think there was a wake up call from like how agile your organizations need to be. And I think this goes all the way up to, you know, the chief people officer. Hey, you know, if if I need to hire a hundred nurses tomorrow, can my team do it? Do we have the organization, the infrastructure, the technology in place? If I have to shift a hundred thousand workers from one area of my business to the uh, other side of my business, do I have, um, you know, the, the technology and the things in place to be able to do that. I mean, these are real examples that you know, we've gotten to see and gotten to see uh, these TA leaders uh, do transformation without having to buy new things, which I think is also just super cool. You know, if you have mm. sort of this bedrock and foundation, you know, a hired score and, and workday, um, you know, already within your organization allows for you to be a lot more creative and move faster and that doesn't require you to have to go to your chief people officer to ask for more money again. It just it mm. allows for your team to actually just use their brains and um, and do some really cool stuff. Yeah, I, th I think you're onto something there. I mean, it was such a beautiful, chaotic, but beautiful moment when operations for almost every single HR organization in the world went digital more or less overnight and uh necessity is the mother of invention right but i also think it was a catalyst for transformation and, and accelerating that dave how, how do you see the conversations that um that you've been having um with talent acquisition leaders with the chro sponsors for transformation uh how has how has the the pressures of or the realities of last year and the widespread disruption changed those conversations from maybe the year before you know, I think it's, I think, I think actually both Athena and Josh captured it really well. I think on, on one hand, you have this, this pressure from senior leadership for things like uh, DE&I coming down on TA, like Athena said, and saying, hey, make this better. <laughs> and, yeah. that, and, that, and that, that TA team says, well, yeah, yeah, we're on board. What do, what do we need to do to do that? Yeah, right. Yes. Uh, and, and yes, yes. And <laughs> Now what? And I think yeah. that uh, somebody else mentioned before that, I mean, like DE&I has had some metrics in the past. We have EEOC, we have OCCP requirements and whatnot that have kind of worked as a, as a, as a guidepost, I guess. But I think organizations are saying that's, that's not enough. Like we need to be doing that times 10, like a, a step function, a different magnitude of, of operational behavior here. And I think that the, there's just a lot of pressure on that team to come up with new metrics, new ideas of what success 
looks like and be able to defend those, not just in, hey, here's our goal, but here's how we're going to do it. Here's how we're going to implement it. Here's the technology we're going to use. It's going to come along with this training. And so I think there's really big pressure items and topics being pushed down on, onto the TA team. And it's not always pushed. Sometimes they're asking for it too, but like uh, a new sort of level of uh, requirements to invent net new things. And I think to Josh's point on the agility, that we're not net new things, but to think about existing things in new ways. And and to Josh's point on agility, it's I think we've really seen uh, teams in the past year or so that are infrastructurally and technology capable of implementing some of those things or trying experiments, doing something new quickly, and then those that that aren't and those that are stuck in in tools, technology, ways of thinking, platforms that are not empowering that way of thinking and trying new things and transformation, but instead are actually inhibiting them. And I think they yeah. then point to things like the technology or the process or sometimes even the people and say, well, we could never do that because of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. I, I mean, it's I'll, easy for us to talk about. Oh, go, who's jumping in? Uh, <laughs> just real, real quick, I just, maybe a shout out to, to Dave and Athena on this. And I think it ties to your, your question earlier. You know, in the, the, on the buy side, you know, as a practitioner, um, I think what Dave just was kind of talking about, it's, you know, you've got your foundational layer, but if you bought the, the technology that not only helps you be creative, but you have the partners to help you innovate and like kick the tires. I think it was always like a big piece for me is like, not only what's the tech you're buying, but almost like who's, whose brain is coming with it. Um, and, you know, I, I was always bugging Athena and, you know, you see, you know, the talent that's at Workday through, you know, the insights of, of Dave on, you know, when you buy this tech, can you get these partners who are willing to be consultative, consultative with you and yeah. bounce ideas and be innovative? Because it goes beyond just like once you've implemented the tech, it's, you know, can I call Dave? Can I call Athena? And I feel oh, like both organizations have just done that so well. Yeah, we're talking about more than, than, than just implementing a new system, right? That's not transformation. Athena, you want to jump in here? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say it's the power of actually an ecosystem and, you know, the notion that one system can be as adaptable and speedy and meet your needs of yesterday, tomorrow. Now all you need to do is re talent redeployment at scale, or now all you need to do is acquire your largest competitor who's underwater and how do you put all the people in new jobs and add restrictions to hiring those that are inbound in 24 hours and you know the com the complexities and scales of problems we saw in covid and the lack of lead time and forward looking awareness to prepare of ta was i imagine something that ta had not experienced in the modern digital age and where we saw success was when clients came to us and beamery and said hey we're going to schedule a call how can you both enable this business challenge I have, and by the way, I have five days, or came to Paradox and us and said, um, all the, we don't have time to provide a great candidate experience, but employee experience matters and Paradox and Hired Score, what can you both do? And in two weeks, we want something live in pre-prod that deals with that. So I think it's a trust, but also how you use that ecosystem to communicate I don't know anything further than here's my business challenge and now you guys go solution of what you can do and how quickly you can do that come back to me and i'll tell you if that meets my needs right i think so you know uh one thing that comes to mind though i mean we're, we're talking about some really big picture problems um i think that we are talking about strategic initiatives um, but one thing that was interesting to me was, and I, and I shared this in the tee up for the conversation, and I, I, I was buying some time for you, Athena, but I also wanted people to see that this conversation started with some research that we did here at Beamery. We asked them what their number one priorities were for, or their top priorities were for transformation this year, and improving recruiter efficiency remains at the top of the to-do list. And that seems like a really tactical thing to me. Um, I mean, reality is, Josh, you know, you'll never get the headcount you want, right? You're you're always going to be lacking in headcount and recruiting. And so you do want to free up capacity. I, I do understand that. But why does this this obsession with efficiency remain at the top? Like, why is why is this still the leading KPI for these initiatives? 
is it transformative or is it just the easiest thing to sell internally from a business case perspective like we will gain this much efficiency which it translates into this many dollars in savings of roi like why are we parked here um and athena maybe you can yeah. can tee us up i'm gonna tee you up and then i'm gonna throw a question to josh or tee us up with a question to josh which hey, who's is moderating here this is my <laughs> well now i have yeah. a camera so um the uh, how 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 often has the mandate for TA expanded across our clients continually and endlessly, but how often has the resourcing for that mandated expanded? And I think, thanks Josh. And I think that's where it might seem like a tactical topic, except when you realize that suddenly they had to do talent acquisition and talent management. And now we want them to do total talent management and include the extended workforce and flex jobs alongside perm jobs and essentially do workforce planning for us and do remote versus in-person decision making and global versus local skills needs understand and so like my endless empathy for the ta org is you've now piled basically every single function you should in consolidated to achieve the business goals but the resources didn't triple when the mandate tripled. So I think the technology can do so much to say the past problem of sourcing and screening augmentation or you know recruiter coordinating, recruiting scheduling and candidate care bots can cover or I know paradox doesn't like to be called a bot but paradox can cover or you know the all the things I need my you know um LMS to do the LMS can do that. And so the fullest extent that you can squeeze out of those systems and automation in some place, augmentation in others, but we can never overlook that the mandate is not shrinking and the resources have not, I've never seen them grow to the same level of the needs that you're asking of that team. So that can be my perspective. I think it is an incredible point um the expanding mandate for talent acquisition and the, in, the the expected parallel expansion of resourcing but the reality and i think this is really the point to underline for the conversation is this is why your transformation is at risk of failing um i i didn't mean to underestimate the value or the importance of of efficiency so thanks for checking me on that what was your question for josh <laughs> My, well, my question for Josh was where you're having those discussions of, I now want your team to take on X. Is there a discussion about, and I'm going to give you the people or the technology budget or the resources to figure out the how, or mm -hmm. it's now figure that out with what you have, right? Yeah, I think I think this goes. It actually ties back into probably that last question, which is I think there's a bit of a shift change. You know, some of the most innovative uh, leaders in TA, I mean, really have just awesome business minds. And so as those conversations are happening, they're talking about the resources, they're talking about the costs that would would come into play. And I mean, they've gotten really savvy at at that, but they've had to be pretty proactive about doing it. I think this. You know, really the last year, two years, though, um, with the attention of the chief people officer and focusing, I think, a lot more, um, you know, this idea that resources are going to be tied to uh, quality improvements and not just speed improvements, I think, really ramp up, um, I think, the resources that the, the teams will be able to do. And then I, th I think just kind of going back into this, you know, the question, Kyle, too, on, um, you know, why does this keep lingering? I think, I mean, totally double click on Athena. I mean, exactly that, it keeps expanding. But I'd also say, you know, tech, even five years ago, it's been like incrementally chipping away. Um, and we're now at this point where it feels like, oh my gosh, we're we're there. Like we, it, it, it the back still needs to be broken. Um, people are recognizing that we need, you know, 40%, 50%, 60% of the time back to our recruiters so that they can use their brains really strategize, really spend time in sourcing and marketing, really spend time talking to candidates who are their rock stars to make sure they come to work for them. Um, you know, that's where we want to to get our recruiters. I mean, we're hiring really smart recruiters who are savvy at a lot of different things and then asking them to 
spend a lot of time in software. Um, and so I, th I think a lot of the data that you're coming back from that report is, wow, like, you know, how do we use their brains more? How do we, how do we get them doing the stuff they just yeah. love to do? I recruited them to. How do they make a bigger impact? I mean, I appreciate both of your perspectives there. I, I do have to know that like, oh, finally we got this solved for a huge part of that. Dave, Workday, I mean, you guys have just heavily disrupted a space that had in major entrenched players and creating a value proposition that resonated with some very important C-level executives. Um, I mean, just standardize, getting every the whole people operation onto the same page, into the mm -hmm. same system, um, I think has been hugely important. I mean, that's that's why the three of us, like Paradox and Hired Score and Beamery, are are here to in, in this conversation right now. I've, I mean, speaking frankly, I'm curious, what is um, what's selling from for like what points are you guys really seeing landing with um, your more strategic buyer now? Um, is is efficiency still a really uh, important aspect of um, of that value proposition? Uh, and I mean, what's their what's their perspective on, on this efficiency conversation? Yeah, so I think actually, I think Athena and Josh sort of teed it up perfectly. I think as oh. it's that that uh, we we do see efficiency, and, and like as to Athena's point, I don't know that a, a efficiency is necessarily the strategic goal. I think. I think efficiency is the blocker to enabling those other strategic goals. Mm. And so I think that we we see TA orgs talk about efficiency because as Athena put it, their scope has grown over time. And with that scope, so have the tools and capabilities and new areas, new tech, new software um, that's important for them to do new things. I mean, you see recruiters doing things in recruitment marketing today that five years ago was was unthinkable, I think. At least it wouldn't have been done in the same way. That's a whole net new space. And so I think the technology is there, is there to help power it. And one of the things that Workday has done, um, you know, behind our, our, our power of one concept that, that really stands out for a lot of our customers is this idea that um, having it all or a lot of it in this single platform so that our, our users can have a consistent experience, the data, analytics, uh, machine learnings, all that all that seamlessly flows across and we can take advantage of things like, yeah. you know, we talked earlier about a skills-based hiring and Workday Skills Cloud and how we're taking skills and leveraging them throughout the entire talent ecosystem for in learning and recruiting and performance and, and sourcing and being able to give, you know, deliver on some of those, some of those promises and some of the things that we've been thinking about being able to do in technology for a long time. But also as Athena pointed out earlier about the ecosystems, like what an exciting time to be in this space, right? Like mm. we are, we are just now, we've been there for a little while, but we are, we're just now, I feel like eclipsing into this, this next phase of the technology is finally capable of living up to what I think a lot of our expectations have been for quite some time. Yeah. And we get to now work with hopefully the, with the customers to try to figure out the right connection. And Workday, while we feel like we do have a, a really strong value prop in the power of one, we know we're never going to, we're not going to have to have everything. We're not the best in the world at a lot of these things. And so being able to work with great partners uh, like Hyatt Score, Beamery, Paradox, and, 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 and this ecosystem uh, is really what I think ultimately creates the best solution for our customers and the best solution for their businesses and what they need uh, to continue moving forward. I think you're right. And you know, if I if I put my analyst hat back on, um, <laughs> I think one of the things that all all four of our organizations are aligned on is this notion of the importance of foundations over features, where we all understand that the integrity of of the data sets that we manage. Um, that we all understand the importance of um, a strong API offering so that we can actually connect our systems to one another. Um, the, the focus on um, creating uh, real tangible value instead of just continuing to dangle out this shiny object in front of people and say, chase this, now go chase this, now chase this. We really are trying to rise the ships with the tide. And um, I, I think it's been one of the most powerful things we've been able to do with some of um, our strategic customers um, over the last year. Um, they really were focused on getting their shit together. I mean, frankly. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, there's a second. There's a second half to this question, um, and I called it out in the in the tee up. We were prioritizing efficiency uh, at a at a rate of 2.2x 
over recruiter experience. And Josh, in, in the report that we put together, you actually have a point of view here around respect or, uh, uh, experience over efficiency. They're not a, 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 a what, what was it? A zero sum equation. Um, I wonder what's going on here. Why what not just like what's the importance of, of recruiter experience? I know we all have thoughts, but why if I asked for their these talent leaders to prioritize these things, why was experience recruiter experience at the lowest end? Is it's not an afterthought, right? I, I just I can't figure it out. And Josh, I just wonder if from the talent leader having just sat in that seat, if you can help me think through it. Yeah, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be. I guess is the the answer. And I think it's an it's interesting that that's how it came back. Is why would we want any of our employees, regardless of recruiter or hiring manager, um, to not have an an amazing experience and one of the highest investments your company is going to make? Um, you know, people is one of the biggest investments our our organizations make, and we want to build great teams, and that's what we're all passionate about. And so the the better your experience, the more simple, the more elegant the more tools you have at your disposal to to bring in great talent into your organization and that makes work fun that makes that makes ah. it exciting to collaborate like why wouldn't we want that so i don't know i think from a why did the data come back in that way i wonder if organizations are seeing the um the efficiencies as such low hanging fruit especially with the technology that's emerging that it's hey if we can declutter some of this stuff we, we call it BS at Paradox, but it's you know, boring stuff in the administrative mm -hmm. stuff, that if we can clear that off, that, that should leave some breathing room. Um, and that breathing room then allows for uh, you, our recruiters, to do the things they just love to do and get out of, yeah. out of technology and out of the software and just work with the people that they want to be um, collaborating with. So no, it, it, it could be a default to that. Um, you know, uh, I appreciate the point, especially because it's my, do you guys know who Tim Sackett? He's a um, recruiting influencer. So he's also a good friend of mine. Um, we were talking about it and he said he feels like it, it's assumed that any, you know, application, any new new solution you're bringing into the stack is already going to be prioritizing that recruiter experience. Um, and so that's not going to be something that is the forefront, like the top three reasons for a business case for investing in a new offering. It, that's the an assumed benefit. That's what gets you to efficiency. I thought that was pretty interesting. Maybe myself as a researcher, I need to take a closer look at some of the answer options in a survey. But um, well, but I, you know, maybe, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say I I don't well, only some of my my clients do I feel have crossed that line between recruiter experience equals ROI and easier to get at ROI and deeper ROI. So I, I don't think that, you know, we understand the value of candidate experience to the brand and the business and top line revenue. We understand the value of, you know, hiring manager experience to manager satisfaction, which is a quantifiable thing that we can all measure. But I, I don't think it's kind of in other places like sales tech and MarTech and FinTech, that's been a few years ahead of deploying intelligent systems like ours. So of course you care about that end user experience because that's the difference between do we reach ROI that we wanted and how much do we reach and how quickly do we reach that? So I wonder if there's not the opportunity to maybe evangelize that further um, because that could be the thing holding you back. Yes, the tech works and that stack works it just wasn't optimized for that end user experience necessarily or configured for the end user experience your company requires. So now you're saying, I didn't see the results, right? It, yes, and, and I appreciate you bringing that up. I mean, uh, look, adoption, user adoption is the bane of our existence, right? I mean, and, and, and I do think it's because, you know, even the way this conversation has gone, we started at really big picture. What are some big things we're trying to solve for? And I think that that is also how a lot of talent leaders are approaching their transformation plans is what are we trying to do up here? But they're not bringing it down to how are we going to empower our recruiters to ensure that we're delivering on this as well. It, it's like that comes down to, oh, well, what's the what's the user workflow that we need to implement around? Like that's, that's where we get to the recruit the user experience and that's not it. 
Um, now, Dave, I, I know that in, in the prep notes, you'd say you, you weren't didn't ha you you didn't want to lead the response to this, but I wonder, <laughs> having heard some of us, uh, if you if you want to riff a little bit and give me some some perspective here. Yeah, for sure. And and just some background there. I think I saw the data that came back in this report, and I think to Josh's point in the report, uh, I I struggle to see how they're separable and so vastly different in the priority between efficiency and experience. I know from a from a user experience perspective and the way that our users are gonna work through our software and our solutions, um, the better, I've seen over time and time again, the better experience we can create, the better efficiency, the happier users, the more other tasks they can create. And so um, I see them as, as interlinked and and uh, would love to spend some more time in the data to try to uncover maybe some some of those assumptions. I think Athena's is, is a really good assumption for where that could come from. I think Josh is also, I think another one that I was just, as I heard you all riffing through this, one that I was thinking through is I wonder if I wonder if, if it's a combination of what Tim Sackett had to say that maybe TA leaders just take for granted or assume that recruiter experience is going to be good enough with these new technologies. And so it is not something we need to, we need to prioritize. Maybe it's that with some sort of combination of, well, the technology is moving to a place of automation in some cases, the technology is moving to a place of of insights and driven and machine learning driven uh, insights and whatnot that maybe there's a there's a um, perfect storm of, of of things coming together with well it should already be good enough and right. the technology is being built to be able to do more so maybe the recruiter experience they're thinking well we don't really need it's a hedge we don't really need to focus on that as much because there's these other things we're investing in that we think is going to get us to that efficiency place that's I can't say I've heard customers say that I'm just trying yeah. to riff through the data on my own and try to maybe come I, to I think it's essential for us as solution providers to think it through so that again we can engage in that advisory relationship with our customers and inform them and help them to, to ensure that they are actually setting the right priorities that is the biggest risk for transformation is we don't know what we're trying to get done or we're not prioritizing the right things um so yeah, you know, and, and I actually really loved um Athena I know that you and, and Tyler Weeks who's previously from Intel um, you had this really great point of view in the report, um, especially around uh, the incorporating AI into the recruiting team in, and thinking about how am I going to leverage an AI solution as, a, and as an extension of my workforce and not just as a tool that I throw at my workforce. And that's a really, I think, sophisticated approach to recruiter experience and technology transformation. It's an intersection of both. I think I think one thing just to add in this discussion is we what we call change management is really this huge massive thing we have to open up called user education of what it is and what it is not and always showing we actually as part of the launch we show compared to what because you just got this tech that now you expect to be perfect and how quickly we forget what we did yesterday morning was 20% accurate and now we've been skyrocketed to 95% but because it's AI we have you know so I think there's a lot of when people complain about a Tesla getting in an accident well Tesla gets in one accident for every nine human accidents so yes and and that went from four to seven to nine in a 12 month span with neural net and machine learning so amazing and it will go i'm sure if you ask elon musk to 20 and 50 but i won't <laughs> <laughs> i won't ask but, him <laughs> but i i think if you if we just if we present that information to these people at the point of that transformation launching and saying here's how it relates to the things you think of in your consumer lives here's what it is and what it is not and here's what it will become i think that would be much easier to ingest I think so, and I, and I honestly think it's imperative that we take the opportunity to lead the, our customers in those conversations as solution providers, not just as vendors. Um, and I hope that everybody who joined us for today's conversation sees the caliber of solution providers that are, are actually out here willing to partner with you and who are pretty geeky for this stuff. We actually care, um, right? Um, I, I want to thank each of you guys for joining us um, and for joining me in this, like the, the research, the thought exercise there but also um, this makes me miss those conference conversations where we've had like maybe too many glasses of wine and we're really getting impassioned. 
Um, but I look forward to continuing the conversation with you all in person sometime in the next year, I hope. So thanks Dave, for joining. Is it Workday, Workday's hosting a virtual happy hour now? Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> it's weird, my wine wasn't delivered, so I don't know what the miscommunication was there. Uh, but thank you each for joining me uh, and, and for being partners. I, I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Kyle. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. Yeah, of course. Um, and uh, for those of you who joined the, the conversation today, of course, we'll be sending out the recording um, as always. So if you want to listen in or share some of these thoughts with um, your, your partners, your colleagues, pl please feel free. Um, we'll also be making sure you get a link to download the research report so you can get nerdy with me next time. Otherwise, I hope that you have a wonderful week. Thanks, everyone.